This is the Lattice Training Podcast, where we bring you the best in climbing performance and training from the world's elite athletes, thought leaders, and coaches. Hello to everyone who has tuned in on the podcast today. I have a really special and quite unusual guest for us today. And this is because I have, well, let's first of all introduce his name. It's Dan Hipkiss, who is the coach and trainer to the Stoltman brothers. And these guys have held multiple world's strongest man titles, as well as Britain's strongest man titles, a number of world records, and also multiple international podiums. Yet it's those guys that you see on the TV carrying out absolutely insane levels of strength, strength challenges, and competition-based ones. And when it comes to getting people outrageously strong, which of course is always interesting to climbers, this guy has been right there at the coalface, working with the very best and seeing what works actually year after year. Now, what's interesting about Dan and why I invited him onto the show today is that he's also a rock climber. And this means he understands the demands of the discipline that we're carrying out as well. And what I think we often do is when we look at these other bigger, more established sports and ones with more money or international attention, is to think that they're doing things that climbing really needs to catch up on and that their practices in these other sports or disciplines may be more advanced than our own and that we should really learn from that. Well, as you know, I absolutely love learning new perspectives. And so in our interview today, I'm going to be picking Dan's brain on the approaches that he takes with these world-class athletes and also others that he's coached from the sports of things like powerlifting, CrossFit, and Olympic weightlifting. So without further ado, welcome onto the show, Dan. Oh, thank you for having me, man. That was uh, yeah, quite an introduction. It's always, yeah, it feels weird when you hear stuff out loud. So just plod along, messing around on the grip and secretly coaching people. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's uh, really nice to hear. Oh well, no problem at all. I mean, I, I'm really excited for this interview today, and obviously, me and you have known each other for a while through the, the Sheffield climbing scene and yeah. things. And just to kind of give everyone a sort of overview of the stuff that we're going to tackle today in the interview, is we're going to cover the frequency and volume of strength training that you do with athletes, because I think that's something that a lot of climbers wonder about when yeah. it comes to strength stuff. Then talk about training weaknesses and deprioritizing strengths. There's yeah, some... which is going to be popular, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Injury prevention, yeah. strength-based athletes and what you're doing on, on in your sport and your discipline. And then lastly is, I'm going to get some thoughts. I know this kind of plays back in some of your coaching and training philosophy how you use deload cycles as a tool for getting stronger or better. Yep. And uh, yeah, what, you, what you're doing on that front. Yeah, no, it'll be good. Spill, spill some of the secrets to the world of climbing. Actually, let me just ask you that question uh, first off, um, because I... No, actually, I'm not going to say what I think. Uh, <laughs> are there any secrets? Um, I mean, the big secret is it's the same thing everyone says, like train consistently. And, you know, make sure nutrition is on point, sleep a lot and work really hard when you need to work hard and recover as hard as you're training. Uh, so there isn't like a glamorous secret. It's the the big secret is to do the stuff you don't want to do. And the people who do the most of that tend to win stuff. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, no sort of first first minute podcast no. <laughs> world changing secret is... thank goodness you didn't say that I was, half, I was half thinking I saw a look in your eyes and went no he is going to go down the whole secret <laughs> line shit actually <laughs> <laughs> no that's good um, and also to just give a bit of perspective to everyone listening um, is can you just kind of give a very quick overview on who or what the brothers are in terms of their achievements in the strongest man world because you yeah. know, us climbers we are aware of who those people are and we see them on tv and things like that but can you just sort of just give an overview to make everyone realize how freaking good these athletes are yeah it's um so tom's the younger brother and he's probably the most successful british strongman ever so he's won 
two world strongest mans, podium twice, made the final, I think five years in a row, won Britain's strongest man twice, has yeah, won a lot of stuff, podiumed in a lot of competitions. Uh, Luke is the older brother, sort of the driving force behind their philosophy about business and how to conduct themselves. Like Luke's very much based about the legacy and building something for the future. Um, and he's competed at World's Strongest Man multiple times, made the final multiple times, um, won Europe's Strongest Man in 2021, podiumed in loads of Giants Live competitions, who are the sort of biggest federation we have in the UK. They've got, they do stuff in Europe and America, but they're sort of the big, the big shows. Um, yeah, he's arguably one of the best log pressers who's ever lived. Tom's, Tom is the best stone lifter there's ever, like there's ever been. No one's ever come close to him, especially with Atlas stones. He's, um, yeah, he's a bit of a freak when it comes to picking up big rocks. Uh, and that's sort of them, you know, as athletes, they just consistently perform. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that most people will know them for is sort of how they conduct themselves with fans and, you know, they do a ridiculous amount of charity work in the local area and stuff. So, yeah, they're as athletes, they're elite level and then they try and conduct themselves in a way to just make a small town in the Scottish Highlands better than it was when they grew up there. Mm, really cool, that. It's ace, because they, like, they, they could just live anywhere. You know, it'd be logical move down to England, at least move to a city, but the same place they've always lived, same friends, same family, like around them, nothing's gone to their head. They just want to make it better. I think, yeah, it's a good, good way to be. So given that you've seen how strong the world's strongest men are, yeah. and you've seen that with your own eyes, you've done training sessions with them, you've watched them in competition, and you've been like right there on the ground, and you know climb as well, yeah. you're a climber as well, and you know some really good climbers, how, how far, or not far, off do you think climbers are in terms of their strength, true strength capacity, your sort of gut intuitive sense on that, given that also we're a lot smaller than these guys who are doing yeah. stuff. We're, I mean, they're huge and we're kind of tiny. Yeah, no, they're, um, you know, you're walking around at World's Strongest Man, people are six foot five, 25, 30 stone, you know, they're, they're big people, but a big part of my work is with uh, weight class athletes. So in strongman and powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting, they have weight classes. So you could have someone 60 kilos competing against other people who are 60 kilos rather than, you know, having a 140 kilo weight difference between athletes, like the bigger one should always win. So we have weight classes. So you can, there's a clear number that, you know, an 80 kilo climber can be directly compared to an 80 kilo strongman. And there's, <laughs> there's like a long way to go. Like, Weight for weight, it's, um, yeah, unbelievable. Some of the lightweight uh, men and women are, you know, deadlift, well, deadlifting 250 kilos at 60 kilos. I've coached a guy who weighed a 99 kilos and he deadlifted 402. <laughs> so it's not like, uh, this is like my big frustration in the world, like world of climbing and strength merging together is... You don't have to be heavy to be strong. You just have to be strong to be strong. And you don't... I think there's a fear that probably comes back from eating one salad a day and foul running to go and climb a new route is getting stronger doesn't make you heavier. And from my point of view, if you... Let's say you put on a kilo of muscle mass, but you can pull five kilos harder you've basically lost four kilos and you don't have to diet yourself into sadness. Mm. So I think the gap is massive, but what really gets me psyched is, does it matter? Like if Adam Andra could deadlift, you know, 220 kilos, would he climb better? 
like there is like there isn't an answer to that because no one does it. I think Eve Gravel's probably the closest, and like he's pretty sick as a climber. Like <laughs> he climbs really hard. He's you know jacked for a climber. Like he carries a lot of muscle mass, and he's really strong. So I think to me that's sort of a model to aim more towards rather than just being as skinny as possible and mm. doing pull-ups and fingerboarding. So what kind of training tools or methods are you using in your industry which you feel are different or better than what we're using in climbing? Other than, of course, moving on from that thing of our climbers being too light and not holding enough mus muscle mass. Is yeah. there anything that you feel like we're missing I think from my point of view, it's, you know, I base my training and coaching around other coaches. So I'm, well, my other half jokes because she came home and I was watching Dodes, which is a Norwegian uh, high diving championship where you have to land on your belly. So why? It's like, because they're really good at that. And if there's anything I can learn from them, then that's what I want to learn. And for me, it's something I'm trying to push in Strongman is having that approach of looking at athletes who are really good at something. And if there's anything you can take from it and apply it to your sport, then it seems like a logical thing to do. Uh, for me, I think just being stronger is rarely going to be a bad thing. And training heavy compound lifts, not... You know, you don't have to hit one rep maxes and you don't have to be blowing a gasket all the time. But I think basic compound lifts are something that will have a massive sort of benefit to climbers, even if it's just from sort of balancing things out, you know, bench press and press stuff overhead. Because you're doing a sport that involves so much pulling, you feel like you should just press, just balance things out a little bit. But surely like compound lifts for example are not the reason why these guys that you're working with are getting so strong for their weight classes yeah um, there must be so my training philosophy that. is about weakness and you're never going to be the best in the world at something or you're not going to improve to the maximum you can if you only train the things you're good at and that like for me that's where i sort of push my athletes and people aren't that keen on it like it's not much fun going into the gym knowing like say your lockout on your deadlift is really weak well we're going to hammer loads of deficit deadlifts and we're going to try and get that part of the lift stronger but you're going to go in lifting less the first week than you think you can you're going to feel really sore you're not going to have the most fun because you're not you know people get into strongman so they can chuck big weights around and to be told well you'll lift more if you lift a bit less and build it up properly like it's not that much fun until you start like getting nice big shiny trophies which are more fun than dealing with a, a slightly less fun sort of block of training yeah so you if I hear this correctly, and do say if I'm, if I'm not this right, is that what you feel like in terms of the strength potential that you see in your industry is more achieved by people like yourself or others being more directed towards working on specific elements of weakness within their physical profile as such yep. over focusing on the things that they're good at. And it's not a question of particular tools or strength training methodology and that climbing has that sorted we're maybe just not tackling yeah because the right things a gym is a gym you know you've got a bar some olympic plates or bumper plates got a bench you've got a squat rack dumbbell like whatever you've got in a gym you could put you know a strong man in there whose focus is strong man or powerlifting or someone in a weight class and the way they approach it, or the way I try and get people to approach it, is everything you're doing is with the view of getting rid of weaknesses. That's why we're you know, heavily dependent on an off-season 
because the competition calendar is quite full on considering what people are trying to do. So the off season is the time where we go, you're just going to have to suck it up and do the stuff that the whole previous year has shown you is a weakness. So like Tom, who he is the greatest stone lifter who's ever lived, doesn't train stones that often in the off season. We'll do it a couple of times just so like his forearm skin doesn't get like too humany, like too, too normal. Um, but he doesn't need to do it. When he went for the world record stone, we realized that if he can get it off the floor, then he can load it. So a lot of the stuff we were doing was to build the strength for that bit of the lift. And I think that application to climbing where, you know, if you look at world-class climbers and all the way down to sort of any level really, where what is the reason you're not getting up something or what's the reason you're not performing? And it seems a lot of the time that doesn't correlate to the training that they're doing. And that seems like an obvious way to, you know, a little mindset shift, which should give pretty good results. Mm. Okay. So, so you feel like that for you transfers all the way through from like elite level climbers through to your weekend warriors and yeah and well anyone doing any sport like i work with um a team gb badminton player and you know he wins a tournament we go well what was wrong with it he's like well i lost the point because i couldn't get from here to here quick enough or this felt weak or you know whatever it is and then we go that's what we need to fix because all the points you've won you've already won them we know what we're doing is letting you win those points but the ones that you lose are the things that like no one wants to lose anything really so you that's the thing you should try and fix mm. yeah i suppose that could almost work on if you took a climber and put them on i don't know like a system board like a kilter board or a moon board yep and then got them to log over a period of time a hundred different problems and document what is the style or the type of move that you fail on each time. Like, why? what's the first thing that you fall off when you're going to do that stuff? Yeah. And then log it in almost like a an order yeah, like... of frequency, and you'd probably know your issue of what you want to tackle. Because I often look at, like, when I go on, I don't know, a, uh, a system board, yeah. I will always go, I've just got weak fingers. I, yeah. I'm not very powerful with fingers, but I actually, in reality, very rarely log in my brain. Does it actually tend to be open crimp moves, or does it tend to be a shouldered crimp move? Yeah, or and is then it is the like, shoulder the issue, or is it like yeah? And is it like front three moves, yeah. back three? I'm, it's just a too broad a sense. It's an interesting way of looking at. That. I just think like because I mean, this is the amazing thing that lattice do and. You know, I always sort of look at other people coaching to find things out. And you have made very measurable things. So you could easily see, like if you take yourself, for example, you've got data that tells you essentially exactly how strong your fingers are. And are your fingers weak is an answer, a question you can answer. Like in Strongman and stuff, we, there's a lot of variation in kit there's a lot of sort of it's not guesswork but you're sort of going you're eliminating stuff rather than having that sort of direct measure uh but you can measure all this mm. so like if you said well i've got weak fingers you i mean i know you, you've got a spreadsheet that tells you exactly how strong your fingers are in every grip position but is that the reason you're not getting up a problem on a system board? Or is it, you know, like a shoulder imbalance? Is there a weakness that it doesn't matter how strong your fingers are if what's trying to make them move isn't strong enough? Yeah, yeah. I suppose that leads me to the next question I was going to ask you is, because we talked about something like really specific, like finger strength and how we might address that. And I think climbers are generally very aware of what yeah. to do that stuff. But how do you, in your industry, 
work this balance between specific training or preparation for performance, but then non-specific. So I guess I would be argue, asking in this question, question, you've got those sort of challenges, you know, like the lifting the stones, all those exercises yeah. that you see on the strongman contests, which are highly specific, and you could train on those, yeah. versus how much time do they spend just in the gym lifting weights? Like, how do you deal with that? Because we have the same problem yeah, in climbing. Do you want to be on rock? Do you want to be on a systems board or fingerboarding or in the weights? gym? So for me, my ideal week, like for a client... Is... Can I ask this in base season versus peak? Yeah. I guess. Well, it's this... So the actual format is, I'd say, 90% of the time the same. So Monday, deadlift. And depending on the competition and depending if it's on season or off season, that deadlift will either be very specific or it will be... Well, it'll either be comp specific or weakness specific. And then press on a Tuesday, Wednesday's for conditioning, Thursday train legs, and then Friday is an events day pretty much all year round. Um, depending if it's competition season or not is what will dictate the events. But I like to keep a Friday for events day because strongman's really hard and you're doing five, six events a day, maybe two days in a row. At World's Strongest Man, you're doing three events a day for five days out of the week. So it's it's brutal. So having that event day in allows us to maintain that conditioning all year round. But in terms of time in the gym, like if I sign a new client up, almost regardless of level, the first thing they do is moan that they're not in the gym enough and they don't think they're doing enough. And then generally they run out with room for trophies and they stop moaning about not doing that much. So also I like have weekends off. Like full-time professional strongmen, you know, one world's strongest man twice in a row having weekends off. And they consistently have weekends off? Every weekend. Spend it with family. You don't lift well if you... I mean, in some ways, you lift really well if you're really sad. <laughs> <laughs> but like a base level of constant sadness, it's not good for you. No, no. I'm sure lots of people are listening to this are just chuckling themselves. It's like, yeah, well, I hate myself. It's when yeah. I climb the best. Oh, no, like self-loathing, <laughs> really good. But like general, like, just go away, do stuff, do things you enjoy mm. and move, a, you know, Strongman is all consuming in the sense like in the on like when they're competing, you know, the lads are eating between five and ten thousand calories a day every single day. So that doesn't just affect them, it affects their friends, their family, you know, their wives, uh you know, you're cooking dinner and it's like you're cooking for a family and it's only for one person. So it's like have weekends off. Like, go and do stuff. The nutritionist really big on, like, if you're having a weekend off and you're going away, try and hit protein. Try and hit, you know, major stuff, but have fun. Like, mm. You've got to enjoy the process. Because I think if you don't enjoy the process, it's 90% of what you do is process. So you've got to enjoy that. And would you say that the balance between non-specific and specific does change across peak and base, or... Are you saying that 90% of the year it runs on that formula, whether you're base or peak? Because that seems unusual to me as a climber. I would go, oh, always I runs the same for me. Oh, interesting. But then, like, each session will change. So, like, the week is structured the same. Other than before World's Strongest Man, we add in another events day because there's 11 or 12 events to prepare for, assuming you, you know, go through the group and get into the final you know, you've got a lot of events to cover and you don't want to be in the gym for like 13 hours on a Friday. So we split that over two days. But otherwise, it's the same all the time. Because it, I, I want to stay sort of fighting fit-ish all the time and then we can just nail things down specifically when competitions come around. Okay. And it sounds like in terms of frequency of training, we're talking... Four hard days per yeah. for your guys, and one day you said conditioning. Yeah, so the conditioning 
at the moment uh, they're preparing for a competition where uh, there's a sled drag or a truck pull. We're not really sure what it will be. So they've got pull a sled for 40 or 70 meters, do some mobility, uh, do some like easy cardio. Um, and then I program meditation for everyone I coach, but I don't program what it is. I think that's something you sh everyone should do in some way is just spend time existing as themselves. Uh, so Wednesday's like a day, middle of the week, just break things up because mon like deadlifting on a Monday is a, it's a good way to start the week, but it sets you up in a low level of constant pain. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like sort of trying to, you know, competition season where working sets are up to 350 to 400 kilos and that's how you're starting your week off so you want a day in the middle just to decompress literally decompress a little bit yeah okay and and what kind of volume are you doing in the sessions given that like for climbers they're also very interested in producing as much strength as possible for the body weight that yeah. they have and I suppose my thought would go to being you guys might be doing a lot more volume perhaps because you will be looking after more of the hypertrophy element and so you'll be working at slightly higher volume and you're not worried about having bigger yeah. athletes. I don't know. Mm. So what people do and what I do is slightly different. Mm. But for me, if so I do a mix between linear periodization and undulating periodization, which was like a really amazing paper written by a guy called Cyril Martin, who is a Team GB weightlifting coach. So as weight goes up, reps and sets sort of flow with the weight. Um, and then all my accessories are pretty linear. So we'd have, like, if we take a deadlift day, I think... At the moment, it's a terrible time because I've got two competitions a week apart. So we're training like a crazy amount of volume on deadlift. But typically, it would be if we're working for deadlift for reps, it'd be like three sets of eight to 12. Uh, and then the weight's just going to go up. But those jumps will be smaller because it's going to go up every week and the volume will be the same. But if we're working to a max, then I'll start at a couple of weeks of like five sets of five and then it'd be three sets of five five sets of three three sets of three uh then three doubles made it maybe two doubles three singles then a deload week and then a max so it's it sounds like quite a lot but you know over eight weeks you're building up to for me, the two doubles people do, or their three singles, should be at their at or above their previous working max. So it, it gets heavy. And it, yeah, those three singles, you look at a plan and think, oh, it's a nice, easy week. And it's like, it's not, you're mm. going to be lifting heavy. Um, and then I do a lot of accessory work. So the bulk of my volume will come from accessory work. Because that's a way we can focus on weaknesses all year round. Right, okay. Like, you've got to deadlift. Like, there isn't competition season. 99% of competitions have a deadlift of some kind. So you have to deadlift. So we can't really do the variations you do on deadlift to work on those weaknesses like you would in the off-season. So we have to work on them with the accessories after that main lift. Mm. And, and what do you, how do you work out when you're doing any training sessions for when the athlete is now ready for the next training session or, or when, what markers do you look for where if you are following this same formula all the way, yeah. all the way through the week, that Monday to Friday practice, where you might say to one of your athletes, Actually, no, knock it on the head today. Don't do this training. Are there particular things that you look for? Because I suppose I asked for climbers' perspective. Yeah. Climbers climb too much. They yeah. train too so much a lot of the time. Off-season, there's a lot more fluidity, and I try and you know push that self-regulation a bit more. So if it's like 
mate, I just feel really beat up today. So I'll pull it back. Like it's fine to pull it back or leave that or drop a set out. You know, you know, you know when you're not feeling good. Like, and like the off season for us is the time to really listen to that. In competition season, I plan deloads in, and it's a case of I've had phone calls where it's like you've just got to survive to this deload. And like for us, it's eat more, just eat, sleep more, like be a less functioning human. Mm. We've got to get to this deload week. Unless it's something drastic, like you've just got to get there. Like it's not a, like they're not going to move World's Strongest Man because you're tired. So we, you know, I plan those deloads in to try and prevent getting to that point where you sort of fall off the cliff. Mm. And then I look at bar speed quite a lot. Um, I used to measure it using uh, like coach's eye and stuff, you know, where you can track how fast the bar's moving. Uh, but as I get to know athletes a bit more and know who they are, just judging bar speed, you know, it might be a case of like you've got all the reps, they weren't as good as they could be. So next week, let's pull it back. But the accessories will stay the same. It won't be a proper deload, but we'll just pull it back for a week and then jump back up. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it sounds relatively intuitive. Oh, it's like and, horrifically know, logical. Yeah. Like, it just, that's why I always feel like weird doing like any sort of podcast or anything because I'm like, it's just really obvious. Like, do do the obvious stuff. And, yeah get better and how do you how much time do you spend on any athlete maintaining their kind of peak or not peak uh, their strengths yeah in their ability when you go into that kind of peak cycle because like we all know that athletes need to be well practiced and functioning in the things that matter. Yeah. And if you spend all of your year moving away from anything which actually matters and they already might be strong on, when they come back into peak, and if you only gave them two weeks and said, "Hey, right, in two weeks you're going to be world class," yeah. Every athlete, no matter how good they are, will go, "No, that's not enough. Two weeks is not yeah. adequate. I need to have had some kind of maintenance." How do you? I mean, if it would, how do you factor that in? I aim for like eight to twelve weeks. It's like a really good prep. 12 weeks we can come out of like Christmas, like finished Christmas, not really trained, you know, spent time with family, ate a lot. Eight to 12 weeks after that, we can be like world class again. Mm. Um, but then, because all the competitions are international and there's a few different organizations, and none of them really talk to each other that much, you end up where like competitions become stacked. So you just have to go into like a comp prep mindset. So in six weeks, the lads are competing in Glasgow. So we're preparing for that competition. But then the week after, they're competing in Texas. So we the events that are similar, you sort of bundle together. And then it just ends up with pulling a sled on your conditioning day because that's one of the events in a competition. So it, Strongman's a weird one because it's so varied you just have to be competition focused a lot of the time mm. but for general strength i would do say like eight weeks of working on a weakness or the weak part of a lift and then have a little deload move to the normal version of that lift and then test that max so you're you're never that far away from being sort of comp fit. Uh, so they're always pretty close to it. Yeah, like, I think... Times year. You don't pull them too far off. Not massive. Like Christmas time, when there's no yeah. competitions, we pull pull stuff back. But I think if I turned around to Tom and said, like, look, I need you to deadlift a thousand pounds next week, be like, yeah, all right then. Yeah. Like, it'd be hard and he wouldn't have the most fun but like he's got the strength to do it mm. it's just remote like same with glute say i need you to chuck 200 kilos overhead even though we're at the start of a prep where he's you know putting 160 overhead which is 
still ridiculously heavy, he could just jump up because we've been there or thereabouts for a couple of years with Luke and four or five with Tom. Mm. So always near as much as possible. And how do you work with the whole, I suppose, um, topic of injury and <laughs> preventing it for these athletes? Because injury is, you know, very yeah, problematic <laughs> yeah. for everyone, especially given that some injuries require a fair bit of time out yeah. to be able to recover that part of the body. Do you... Are you very, very disciplined in trying to prevent the thing in the first place, or are you just very on it with the initial management of an injury when it's it crops up? Like, what's sort the of, it's, like? So it's both. Like, realistically, I, I think in eight years, we've had one client get injured whilst following their plan. And it turns out, like, they hadn't, I think they'd driven for like eight hours and they haven't really drank anything. But, any other injury that my clients have picked up have been either going off plan, one of them fell down the stairs and tore his lap, which is ridiculous, uh, or in competition. So for us, competition is a time that we do everything we can to prevent injury, but it's an extreme sport. Strongman especially is an extreme sport. You know, you if you 30 people are going to pick up a car and try and run 20 meters with it, someone they're not always going to get injured but you know the odds are starting to stack up a little bit so i try and prevent them as much as possible really try and prevent them in training i think it's there's just ways to avoid it there's you know things you can do to help prevent injury i should listen to everything i'm saying now because i pick up stupid injuries um but try and prevent it. And then that's, you know, I was saying with the off season where we're trying to build that self-regulation, it's that sort of having a conversation of this doesn't feel right today. Well, what is it and what do we need to do to make it feel good again? Like, is it a case of like, say your hamstrings are really sore, like for climbing, if your fingers are sore, that's not always an injury. You know, soreness isn't always bad. It's not always good either. Like, you shouldn't strive to feel broken. But I think, you know, if your fingers feel a bit sore, then just weigh up. Like, is this the start of an injury? Or did I did you spend five hours on a systems board and your fingers are going to be sore because you've knackered your fingers? And then you make a decision about, if this is the start of an injury, do you just swivel for a bit and, you know, do really sub-max work or do you rest for a week and then jump back in? And, you know, that's where that self-regulation comes in of understanding sort of what feels like what and, you know, what's soreness, what's injury, what's like actually injured. Uh, the good it's not yeah the sort of good thing is like a lot of injuries are quite acute like something has gone wrong so you've got like a definite marker of something's gone wrong so like i popped my whatever that that one is i think a2 mm -hmm. yeah um and it was really loud and i thought i'd snap to hold so there wasn't like a question of have i injured myself like there was a catastrophic event I knew I was injured but if you wake up and you're like oh my tendons feel really sore if there's not a logical reason for it and you can't justify ignoring a logical reason then just rest or do something else like you don't have to do nothing to rest you can just you know if your fingers hurt when you're like full crimping small edges but you still want to go climbing, don't fall crimp small edges for a week or two. And if they feel better, then build it back up. Yeah. Like, yeah, to me, it seems really obvious. It's annoyingly obvious to say, and then, like, I tore my bicep two weeks ago because I didn't do anything I tell other people to do. 
so it's like I'm going to listen back to this and just be like that guy doesn't know what he's on about just ignore him well maybe that's what we do as coaches and trainers is we do all the self-experimentation find out the things that go wrong yeah. and then keep keep the clients away from these habits and and patterns and stuff yeah no that seems that's a better way of justifying my own stupidity i think yeah yeah well yeah is what do you think what do you think climbers on the whole mostly get wrong or right in terms of injury prevention or management that you see within that population that kind of crosses over from your own industry because like i came for to climbing from martial arts and athletics yeah and i looked at some of the stuff that climbers were doing and went oh that's great yes. you're doing these things really well and that's exactly what i've seen in these other yep. sports or injuries well done and i didn't really want to affect any kind of change in the industry yep. but other bits i went why is this not happening? And I've yeah. seen it from other sports. So I'm interested to see whether there's something. So there. to me, I think, so climbers in general is a term that's sort of way too broad to say, you know, this is good, this is bad. But, you know, the stuff that in terms of like finger training, I think climbers are on the whole pretty good in terms of knowing what to do. I think at the moment, uh, people like yourselves and Emil and, you know, are putting good content out there in terms of sort of managing fatigue and managing injury. And I think that's an approach that more people should take because every, I don't, pretty much everyone knows how to use a fingerboard. Like you can hang in some way. But when I started climbing, I was guilty of just, you know, I mean, I picked up a load of old copies of On the Edge to drop off to someone. So flicking through stuff like that, and it's like the fingerboarding that was being done back in the day maybe wasn't the wisest thing. And I think there's a big population of climbers that still train as if sport hasn't developed since, like, 1978. Like, that's how you train for climbing. And that's what you do. I think the massive benefit will come from looking outside of climbing and looking at the people who are really good at the component parts of what climbing needs, especially with like competition climbing and that move towards like more parkour stuff. Is look at gymnasts, look at athletes, look at people who do parkour, you know, like where they can die if they do it badly. And find out how they're training, and find out what they're doing to. Is there anything? In, is there anything in particular that you look at in climbers and think that's really good, or that's really I not think very good? Like, there's like nothing specific things. There's nothing super specific. I think the the mindset that we discussed earlier. I think that's quite a big sort of factor with it. I think the biggest issue that climbing faces in relation to strength is the fear that lifting weights will make you heavy and that just isn't a thing and i think people tend to avoid lifting weights because there's this fear of getting heavy or not being able to do certain things you know this avoidance of like training legs and stuff and you know it's unless you're climbing like crazy steep stuff you're using your legs a lot like a lot of your weight is being taken on them, even on steep stuff, you know, you need that strength there. And I think that breaking that fear of being generally strong would be a, a good step to take. And then there's this sort of justification where any climber I've spoken to is like, yeah, but we're really light. Like, I'm strong for my weight. It's like, not really. Like, not compared to actual strength like you're strong for a climber but that that's you know the top end of climbing strength is like around the middle of the lightest weight category of female strong women and you know there's a lot in terms of what you think they can do for that muscle mass. Yeah. From a strength perspective. You know, there's 63 kilo women. Like, the weight classes are 63 to 64, depending where you are, for the lightest weight women. 
and they're deadlifting like I mean God, what's read at like two sixty to eighty kilos. But don't we look at deadlifting in climbing and go, well, but just that... being stronger, like you, if I could train someone and they're like, I can only go to the gym and do one thing, go and deadlift. Like that's the ultimate exercise for just getting stronger in every way. Because a heavy deadlift, like even your soul is like not in a great place. Like every part of you is working hard. And you, you know, if you're not going to use straps, then your grip's going to improve. You can deadlift on axles. You can, like, to me, that's like the ultimate measure of how actually strong someone is. Because mm. I used to be like, how, oh, you go to the gym, how much do you bench? So I don't know, just deadlift. Like, you know, somewhat, it's like a balance of strength as well. You can't have any weakness you have when deadlifting heavy will become really apparent. I better get on the deadlift. Yeah, man, it's the way forward. I hate the deadlifting. Maybe that's why I'm so weak. <laughs> I don't like it when you say things like this. <laughs> I'm still sceptical. I'm going, oh, I don't know. Well, this is what I find really fascinating because there is like almost a stone wall in climbing, a small amount of pun intended, where no one's really willing to try it that much and really commit to getting stronger in like a generic strength way they're always you know you talk to people like, oh that's a really good idea i don't want to do it mm. so you know having that case study where you could actually see you know i'm like the level below andre because he's he's not going to deadlift more and climb 10c like it's you know, that's not where I'm that interested. But, you know, that sort of step below is where I think getting really strong in compound gym lifts will probably have a pretty big translation to climbing. And I think you don't need to train events. So off my sort of schedule, that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the gym. And, like, train for an hour. 45 minutes to an hour and a half that's like a normal gym session and you could fingerboard or you could do something on a moonboard or you could go and do some bouldering on those days anyway mm. so it's not like you're gonna quit climbing to get really strong it's just i think i personally i'd be really interested you know to take a climber for eight weeks and just see like train like this do this side of you know actual climbing training don't stop that but add in you know heavy deadlifts heavy overhead pressing squat in some way and see what happens it's perfect dan this is this is the moment we've all been waiting for it's eight weeks until i go and try my project in the usa that'll do take me on <laughs> like, <Plus> master jedi <laughs> I'd, I'd do it by eight week plan i'm a total punter Perfect. I wouldn't say total. <laughs> I'm just going to solo London Wall for the hundredth time. But yeah, total punt. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's the maybe thing. That I'm... Then, then we do a retrospective podcast. Well, maybe if there is no retrospective <laughs> podcast, if it's that's just really you, interesting. If it's just you, <laughs> it's, like, it's gone badly. <laughs> no, I uh, think you know that's the thing that I'm. Like, I'm so fortunate in the world of climbing to know the people I know. But I almost have missed that middle gap. Like the people I hang around with are pretty much near the top end of what they do. So I, I wouldn't want to turn around to someone like a competition climber during competition season and be like, oh, change everything. Like it's, you know, irresponsible as a coach to be like, oh, stop everything you're doing. I know you're competing in however long, but finding that balance of someone who has a goal in mind in a period of time and just seeing what happens because it's not yeah i'm cautious of you know this is pretty experimental from my point of view so i don't want to be like 
if someone's planning to solo L cap and they're like, oh, I want to use this strength training to try that, I'm not into that because if it doesn't work and you've based everything off this strength training, like you'll be properly dead. But if it's a, a situation where they're willing to embrace this style of training and this mindset shift, and I think the mindset shift would have to translate into climbing specific training as well. We'll just see what happens. Mm. We might come back to this then. Nine weeks time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last topic of today that I wanted to go through, and it's another one that lots of climbers are kind of aware of. We talk about it quite a lot at Lattice, and it's something that often is a point of discussion really early on with clients where we go, this thing is very useful. Please, can you incorporate this into your mesocycle, macro cycles of training? It will give you a lot more improvements than you think is the deload. Yeah, it's an unpopular word. Yeah. First off, I'm going to ask, what is for you a definition of a deload? What does that mean to you as a trainer and what you do? I mean, I'm lucky that... You know, over seven or eight years of coaching, and I sort of dropped into coaching an elite level of athlete, I've decided what a deload is, and that is what it is. And it always has been, and until something drastic happens, it always will be. And that is three sessions of three by three, squat, overhead press, box jumps, under 50% of max, or 50% or under, and for the first two sessions, very light core work. And for Strongman, if you're competing on a Saturday, that last deload session will be done on the Wednesday, Thursday at the latest, and then we have like, go and eat and sleep and don't train. So for me, that's what a deload is. I view it as a time to consolidate the work that we've done ready for competition. Okay. And how do you use these in your general training cycles? Do you place them in just before a competition or do you place them every four weeks, every eight weeks? So competition season, the week before a competition is deload week. Yeah, kind of like, and you just consider it like a taper. Yeah, like, but it's like a, a, it's the sort of taper that's totally vertical. Right. So like we build up, uh, try and deadlift 10 days sort of no sooner than 10 days before the competition because that's the most fatiguing thing is CNS will be fried and then that week of competition like competing on a Saturday Monday 3-3s three less than 50% Tuesday same, Wednesday same then nothing until the competition but we've already done all the work and that's the thing people I mean, really get freaked out about it. I feel the strongest I've ever felt. Why am I going into the gym and putting so little weight on a bar? And for me, part of the benefit is how angry it makes people. So you go into, you know, go into competition and you've not lifted heavy for a week. You're so fired up and so angry that you've not lifted heavy. Then when you go into the event, you know, you're fresh and also really angry, which is like a really good com- combination. Uh, when I first started getting people to deload, um, you know, even a few days before competition, you'd be looking at other athletes still lifting heavy. It's like, God, they, they look really strong. Like, at first I was like, I might have made a mistake here. Like, they're pushing it and then like the first event comes around and they're like hammering it and they look amazing and then you can just see the body just go i'm done now like, that's it like and they just crash whereas you know the guys i coach so far tend to improve as a competition goes on because they're, they're fresh they go into a show at 100 percent rather than being beaten up and knackered mm. in general training Either four or eight weeks. Well, if it's a four-week one, I'll deload a lift or maybe two lifts. If it's eight weeks, then it might be like the full deload week. Interesting. So yeah, you're deloading on specific elements that you've been working on. So 
yeah, like if you take that across into climbing, you could take a sort of strategic view of I will deload on finger strength work. Yeah, and that but could I be a week, one session. On something else like shoulders, yeah. for example. And it just, you know, your body, like strength and like it's a response to stress. But at a point, that stress will sort of get diminishing returns. And having that week off, to me, it just lets stuff get back to a position where it's either recovered to compete in our case, or it's just recovered to start training hard again. Mm. And I think four weeks is like a good time uh, if you're deloading like a specific thing. Because in that sort of fifth week where you deload, you you sort of work quite hard for four weeks. If you train really focused and you're training on weaknesses as well, like because I'm so into training on the weaknesses, the muscle groups that are weak generally. So you you know, they're working essentially harder than they've ever worked. So having a deload isn't really a bad thing. Mm. And if you were to take one thing from your <laughs> world, your industry, like if you had a genie in a bottle and you're having one wish, what what would you gift to the climbing population from what you've learned in terms of what you practice or what you've seen or observed in those sports and give it to the entire climbing community and go, if you could just get on with this thing, it probably, in a broad sense, would really help climbers. So from my specific philosophy, it is just training on weaknesses. Like if people do that, they'll improve. From strongman in general, I think it's that mindset of this thing that I'm doing is going to happen. Like you put whatever space you need to put your head into for that period of time, it is happening. Um, and I think whenever I've climbed sort of at my best or like doing a new route where you think I'm not in a position to make a mistake here, getting into that old gym mindset, you just can pull so much harder. You can try way harder than you think you can. If you find what your headspace is for sort of performance i suppose i think it's like golgi tendon inhibition and stuff like that where you're like if i'm struggling on something i just need to sit and like who i'm climbing with i'll say like just give me a minute just sit and get into that old headspace and you can just do stuff that you didn't think you could do and it's like lasco like i did a new um hang uh stony so you know in Tom's cave, there's like flared jams on the outside. One of them's called the Alps, which is like a stacked fist jam that uh, Paul Mitchell put up. And then further along near like the cave entrance, there's one that was like a flared stacked hand and fist. And I just couldn't, I, I just wanted to do that problem. Like I think it was new, really wanted to do it, couldn't do it, greasing out of it just getting worse every attempt and I was like just give me a minute just sat had a look out at an awful building site and got back into the old headspace and I was like oh yeah it's pretty easy actually like it's not that bad if you get really angry and just focus on actual performance instead of sort of do all your thinking and then act rather than trying to blend them too much mm -hmm. cool yeah, really cool. So, um, yeah, really pointless problem to get really psyched about. <laughs> yeah, but I get it, I get it. I definitely get it. It's good to, good to hear that. For anyone listening, if you just uh, kind of noticed some weird low grumbling noises <laughs> in the background, that's not mine or Dan's <laughs> stomachs. That's an impact driver because <laughs> next door to us at Lattice, they're doing some root setting and I might have forgotten to tell everyone that we were recording a podcast <laughs> right now so that's what that sound is um and it's no. atmospheric yeah exactly you know a real climate <laughs> because there's roots that are going on in the background but dan thanks so much for 
joining me for this interview today and it's really appreciated your time and oh, thank you for having me my expertise um i'm sure some people will be interested in knowing a little bit more about what you do what you're up to where can they find you is it a website or is it um, socials where's the best place to find you so i've got dan hipkiss coaching on instagram which is like coaching and then just dan hipkiss is pictures of climbing and of my dog so I've tried to separate them because uh, I realised I was so oh, I'm going to put out loads of coaching content. I was like, oh, my dog's really cute. So yeah, yeah, that's filled that. So I've separated them, and then that's it really. Contact me through there, um, and then depending what it is, I can direct people. But yeah, just send me a DM on one of them and try and help people. Sweet. And we'll yeah, nine weeks. Get a nice picture of you on top of some project, looking really jacked. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see what happens <laughs> to the deadlift. Better go and, uh, yeah, look at that. Awesome. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan.